Jake and Ava, a boy and a fish, tells two parallel stories of a boy going fishing for the first time and a fish going insect catching uh, for the first time. And they they proceed on parallel and then the boy catches this fish and the two, two stories can converge and it becomes a story of empathy from that moment. Well, I think of children as a very, a very important audience to reach, if one can. I mean, the future leaders are are the young people of today. I always thought it would be fun to write for that audience, uh, to have the freedom of writing fiction rather than nonfiction. Although I love to write nonfiction, and I had an experience as a child fishing, and I and I think it probably reflects the experience of many children who have misgivings about the the activity, but don't express them and suppress them because. The, the grown-ups, the ones we look up to, the leaders of today, you know, are saying it's good, it's okay, you know. So I wanted to try and validate those feelings of concern that I think a lot of children have, as I did. The story uh, of Jake and Ava, a boy and a fish, is is set in a very different place uh, with different kinds of fish than 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 I experienced as a child growing up in Ontario, Canada, at summer camp when I was taken out fishing. Um, but the emotional experience, the physical and emotional experience, is 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 quite similar. Uh, with the 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 father figure in this case, Jake's granddad, uh, this beneficent, nice, avuncular man. Uh, and this young boy who's all excited about the experience uh, and the experience turns into unexpected emotions arise when he actually catches the fish and sees the fish and he, he's a, he's a boy like I was with a with quite a large capacity for empathy to put oneself in the place of the other and uh, he immediately identifies with the fish when the fish comes out and he sees this fish with a hook in the mouth hanging gasping to breathe um, and uh, it's very it doesn't take much imagination to conclude that that fish is not a happy not a happy animal and the fish is suffering and there's a risk of dying and uh, I, I've never fully grasped why some people seem to be just completely shut off to this and don't seem to be bothered by that or disturbed uh, but I do know there are many who who identify with with the fish and 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 feel sorry for it. And and my my impulse was I just wanted those fish to go back in the water when I saw them pulled out. I was motivated by the remarkable behavior of these of these fishes. Archer fish are named the six known species, and they're named for their ability to aim and shoot water at flying insects or perched insects. But in, but but flying insects is particularly requires a lot of skill, and they actually have been shown ex in, in in captive experiments to be able to learn that skill or hone it without actually doing it themselves by watching uh, other fish, other archer fish who are experienced. And just by watching that, they can become more proficient without doing it themselves. That's called learning by observation, which is considered a quite high level cognitive feat. Um, so the fact that they they show this awareness, it's not um, built into their system. They need to learn it. There's a learning curve, just like a, a surgeon learning to do heart surgery, say, you know, archer fish have to learn and they have to hone their skills to become good at it. Um, so all of those kinds of characteristics, uh, I thought, lent themselves well um, to impressing upon the reader that fishes do neat stuff. Uh, my book, What a Fish Knows, for grown-ups, is all about that. Uh, and, and connecting that to our troubled relationship with these animals. So that was that was the idea there was to was to take a, a, a species with really interesting behavior, and uh, hopefully raise eyebrows and uh, and make people think and scratch their heads a little bit more uh, than we usually do about these animals, which are so commonly demeaned as as unfeeling and unthinking, which is science has shown is radically not the case. I think so much of what children learn and take on board is through the example set by the grown-ups, uh, which is why f taking them fishing is such a, uh, a potent uh, message, um, not necessarily for the good, I would say not for the good. Um, 
you know, we take our cues from the grown-ups when we're kids. We, we all grown-ups today were kids at one time, and we, um, we, we look to the grown-ups uh, consciously or subconsciously as the sort of the the guides of, of how we should behave. Uh, often we uh, we don't do a good job at, at at behaving in ways that we want our kids to to learn. Uh, don't do it as I did it. Uh, kind of kind of thing. So I would say for parents who who are, you know were raising children, I raised a daughter. I think taking them out in nature and showing, uh, you know, teaching by by doing, um, you know, just the act of seeing a caterpillar and stooping down to look closer or rescue it from a, a footpath where it might get squashed and and to give voice to that and put it in the side where it's safe. Uh, just, just a, you know, catching a fly in in a window and and taking it outside and letting it go, uh, powerful lessons there. Just as just as the opposite kind of thing, squashing an insect or or using a fly swat, uh, or 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 insecticide spray. Those send powerful messages that this is okay. This is the this is the proper way to react. And I've seen kids squash insects, and I know where they learned it. They learned it from uh, from the, the someone bigger modeling the behavior for them. Yeah, it's an important question. I mean, fish farming and agriculture, uh, factory farming of fishes has, has been the fastest growing sector of uh, food production for human consumption in the last couple of decades, at least. Uh, you know, agriculture has, is a lovely word. It sounds great. But the, the reality, of course, is it, uh, I like to call it factory farming of fishes because that's really what it is. It's intensive confinement. The animals have no freedoms. Uh, they're stressed. They're crowded. There's competition. There's pesticides. There's pests or, or parasites. Uh, you know, just problem after problem. And uh, mortality rates can be very high. Stress rates are very high. Um, and also, you know, there's this, there's this sort of tacit belief that uh, at least it takes stress and pressure off of wild fish populations, which is um, not the case because uh, most of these the fish that humans like to eat are predatory fish. They eat other fish and the other fish they're typically fed that are fed to them in, in these aquaculture operations are wild caught menhaden, sardines, and, and smaller fish like that. So it doesn't really take pressure off wild populations. Uh, but even if it did, uh, factory farming of fish has a host of its own problems, both welfare and, and ecological and environmental. Yeah, that was a big part of the motivation for researching and writing uh, the book on uh, What a Fish Knows, a, a book that sort of brings, uh, synthesizes the current knowledge that we have of fishes and puts it in one place. Uh, I'd love to say that just the knowledge, the facts is enough to change behavior, you know, get get the information up here uh, and people will get on board and they'll and they'll change, just show them what they the fish do. I think that has utility, but it, unless you reach here, unless you engage emotions, you're only going to get so far, uh, which is why as a science writer, I've learned that telling stories uh, is a very p powerful and important part of delivering a message and changing behavior. If you can tell a story that people relate to the fish, uh, they, they see not just a thing or, or a biological entity, but an individual who has interests, uh, concerns, thinks about things, uh, behaves in a flexible manner, has emotions, can feel stress, uh, shows parenting behavior, shows social behavior, virtue. I mean, the list goes on of the things that fishes can and do do and that, that have been shown by science. Uh, so I, I've learned as a science writer to include a, a lot of stories, personal accounts if I have them, but also stories from other people. So I think engaging the emotions, uh, by all means, uh, share facts. And uh, but, but, but the more, more we can engage people's emotions, the better. It is, of course, challenging. Fishes evolved in an aquatic environment environment. Uh, they don't they don't blink. Uh, they don't need to. Their eyes are bathed in water. Uh, they they do make all sorts of sounds, but those sounds are propagated underwater and we don't generally hear them. So so we're we're more restricted in how we can relate to them. We don't we don't recognize facial expressions and body postures. Uh, the fishes tune into a lot of this stuff. It's subtle and nuanced ways, but we don't. So it is definitely challenging. Uh, I make no bones of the fact that, that the fishes are more challenging than any other vertebrate animal to get people to relate to. Uh, but we can do it. Um, and I think uh, 
showing what they're capable of and telling stories is a big part of, of hopefully changing that, that, that view. Mm -hmm.